Discussions of responsible behavior and space threats have traditionally been dominated by the major space powers and perceived as something that the commercial sector need not weigh in on. However, given that space is a shared domain, everyone, space actors and non-space actors alike, governments, industry, and civil society, has a role to play in the predictability, stability, and security of the space environment. It has been a, the security of space has been a concern since the beginning of the space age. It is more acute now because more than 100 countries have satellites in orbit, and there is a rising dependency on space capabilities for such critical needs as economic development, environmental monitoring, and disaster management. Although space security has historically perceived as only relevant to the geopolitical superpowers, nearly every person on this planet uses space data in some way, shape, or form, and thus benefits from a predictable space environment with reliable access to that information. I would be remiss, and my boss would be very upset with me if I not take this opportunity to mention several Secure World Foundation publications that are relevant to this topic that are free and available on our website. The first is our Global Counterspace um, Capabilities and Open Source Assessment. It looks at five different sorts of counterspace capabilities for 11 countries. It is available in English, and I'm happy to report the executive summary has been translated into all six UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Russian, and Spanish. Another publication demonstrates why we should all care about space security issues. Secure World Foundation's anti-satellite test debris infographic, which illustrates how the force of impact can disperse debris to much higher altitudes than when the test took place. This is relevant because the higher the orbit, the longer the lifespan the debris has, which in turn gives it more time to threaten other spacecraft and satellites in orbit. Since the 1960s, destructive anti-satellite tests have created 6,850 pieces of trackable debris. Of that, nearly 3,500 pieces of debris are still in orbit. All countries should be concerned about space debris from anti-satellite tests, as debris is agnostic in terms of whose satellites it threatens. It does not matter if the country who held the test is a geopolitical ally or not. It is relevant to the commercial space sector, as the instability produced by a breakdown in space security can pose a direct threat to future economic activity in Earth orbit, raising the cost of current and future enterprises there in an already unpredictable and expensive environment. Um, I would like now to turn to our poll. So we asked who should have an opinion on and participate in space security discussions. And we had uh, several options, geopolitical superpowers, states with their own satellites, commercial space actors, states without their own satellites, and then E, all the above. Um, I admit I may have um, had a position I wanted people to take, and it looks like <laughs> um, so people were agreeing, but the, this was a, there was a trick question. It was E, all the above, in my opinion. And um, hopefully this session will leave you with that same opinion as well. So with that, you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to our fantastic panelists. Let me introduce them. Um, we have Anredi Damazio, who's a counselor of the Nigerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the permanent mission of Nigeria Disarmament. We have Maurice Ducharme, the Special Advisor on Space, Strategic Joint Staff, Department of National Defense and Canadian Armed Forces. We have Tim McClay, CSO and U.S. General Manager, ClearSpace. We have Anirudh Sharma, who's the co-founder and CEO of Digintara. And then finally, we have Michael Spees, our P Political Affairs Officer of the United Nations Office of for disarmament affairs. So for everyone here and online, um, questions will be submitted via the Q&A feature on the Whova app, and I will look through and try and select some as, as much as we can to get through in the time that we have allotted. But as you may probably not be surprised to hear, I have a lot to say in this matter, and I have questions I've set up for my panelists, so we'll start with those. Uh, first, Tim, can you talk a little bit about what does ClearSpace see as some of the biggest destabilizing activities in space security and stability? Yeah, well, Victoria, thank you very much for the, the invitation to, to participate today. And thank you to the Secure World Foundation for putting together this event. You guys always put on a fantastic event, and you just hone right in on the most relevant and urgent topics. So thank you for that. Um, I think the easiest answer to, to give to that is ASAT testing. That's sort of the obvious answer. Um, but I want to take a few minutes to kind of peel that back a little bit and, and see what lies underneath. Um, the, the way I would break this down is to look at the long-term trends and then look at perturbing functions on top of that. So um, 
I first studied orbital debris in 1987, so it was a long time ago. It was back when, honestly, orbital debris was really just an academic topic. There was no money for research, there was barely a session at an aerospace conference, and it wasn't on operators' minds. You fast forward 35 years to today, and it is at the forefront of every operator's mind. It's one of the largest threats to the International Space Station, and it's a very real national security concern, both for the US and, and our allies. Um, <clears throat> so I think our activity as a whole over those 35 years and beyond, and, and even before that, rather than singling out a particular kind of activity, represents a destabilizing or a threat to safety in space. That growth of debris over time has been largely unchecked. Um, on top of this, I think that militarization of space represents the largest potential perturbing function or forcing function on instability. Uh, you know, there, there is a lot of discussion about war and preparation for war in space. Uh, most of it is about U.S. and China and the tensions that are building, but other states are not out of that realm of possibility, and even non-state actors. I mean, the fact is, it's not that hard to mess up space. Um, you know, I think that, the, in fact, our reliance and, and our, the focus that we put on our reliance on space applications and space assets is one of the reasons that we tout the importance of space sustainability, but it is also, uh, it also puts a big target on us, right? The, the, the greatest equalizer in an asymmetric conflict is mutual destruction. So a lesser state with, with, without a whole lot of space assets might look at just creating a mess as a really attractive option. Um, and, and to be clear, space is a really different warfighting domain, right, it, it, physically. Um, if you shoot down an airplane, all the debris falls to the ground. Right? You sweep it up and off it goes. You, you destroy a ship and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Well, if you obliterate a satellite, that shrapnel stays in orbit for years, potentially decades, even centuries, and it, and it creates a threat to, to national security, uh, sustainability, and safety for, for a very long time. So I think the takeaway is that, that the LEO environment in particular is a really fragile one. Um, the only natural cleansing mechanism is atmospheric drag, and it, and, and it is less and less effective exponentially with altitude. And that's all you got. So. <clears throat> If we were to have a full-scale armed conflict in space, um, the LEO environment or the GEO environment would not recover, period. Not in our lifetimes, not in the lifetimes of our grandchildren. And so I think that is, is really the militarization buildup is the principal threat that I see to stability and safety. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, let's go on to Anirud. Anirud. How can the deliberate creation of debris complicate the SSA picture? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, here at Victoria and uh, Secure World Foundation. Uh, I mean, I think uh, most of the importance of uh, you know, creating deliberate debris has been covered by Tim here when he mentioned about the ASAT tests and few things that have been done for uh, militarizing space. So there are a lot of nations that have performed uh, certain ASAT tests which has created a lot of debris. And we've seen this happening from the start of the space race, right? Like before ASATs or all the militarization of space activities, space uh, was initially perceived that there'll be no commercial space actors working and there were just governments launching more and more satellites. So at this point in time, uh, we have commercial interest in space and space is very important for everyone. I mean, in our daily life, space is really important. Talking from the space situation awareness perspective, the entire value chain of uh, SSA, I mean, the technical part of it, uh, the way you determine an object in space and then catalog, it's all about understanding what's happening in space or uh, knowing where each and every object is. It is not just important for us to know the position, but also to understand and characterize each of these objects. Now, when uh, the debris is created deliberately, 
what makes it difficult for us or an SSA company or even any organization working on SSA is to understand the difference between the debris that is already there or created uh, by the natural cause and the, uh, the deliberate creation of debris. There is always a confusion between tracking and identifying such debris particles, which increases the collision risk. The main reason to that is uh, it takes a while for us to even distinguish uh, where this object is or which object is this, whether this is an object that uh, is a breakup of another satellite or was it caused due to a ASAT test kind of a, I mean, or a kinetic warfare. So that makes it difficult for us to even catalog an object and it is an entire value chain uh, when you talk about space situational awareness starting from initial order determination, you have to start uh, with understanding if this object should be catalogued and then orbit determination. It takes a while for any agency to, to even understand uh, how much of impact that these uh, tests have created. So, um, you know, at the end, it is not in the best interest even for commercial agencies or um, governments or even military agencies because at the end of the day, it's at, I mean, the space is at stake. Uh, so, uh, what I'd like to say is uh, it not only increases the collision risk, at the same time, tracking and identification of these debris particles uh, created uh, will be very difficult and it takes some time for us to know the impact. And we've seen in the past, a lot of these debris uh, that has been created by the ASAT tests, uh, be it China, India, Russia, US. So we have seen the remains of it. I mean, Russia has around 35% of debris. I mean, they contribute 35% of debris particles in the orbit in around 800, 700 to 800 kilometer. And it's still there. It takes a lot of time to get down. Like Tim said, gave an example of uh, the aviation sector. In the aviation sector, when there is a collision, it falls down, but in space, it still remains. And these remains just increase, and we've heard of this term called Kessler syndrome, uh, which just multiplies. Uh, we've not seen such instance yet, but it is prone to happen looking at how the space is uh, getting crowded or congested by a lot of commercial actors, and we have mega constellations right now. So uh, in the best interest of the economy and the sustainability of the orbit, it is, um, I mean, we've taken active steps already to, to ensure that there are no more ASAT tests or kinetic warfare in the orbit. Thank you. Uh, Michael, um, so the UN is undergoing a process called an open-ended working group um, that's been happening in Geneva for the past year or so. Uh, for this crowd, could you explain a little bit about what it is, what it's trying to do, and then, Talk about, you know, why is it focusing on identifying responsible behavior in space? Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria, and to the Sakura World Foundation for um, inviting uh, the UN to be part of this conversation, and also to the uh, very excellent uh, framing uh, for this uh, session. Uh, so I think it's, it's important to uh, you know, acknowledge that um, you know, the sustainability aspect uh, has a security dimension um, as well, and, and the work that uh, we've been doing on the security dimensions are often a, a bit less uh, well, well known. Um, most of the discussions take place in, in Geneva and the specialized uh, disarmament bodies of, of the UN and these are traditionally um, a bit less accessible to um, a, a, wide, a variety of stakeholders. Uh, but, but this is a trend that is um, um, changing and I'll, I'll speak to that um, a little bit later. Um, so, um, you know, building on the uh, comments from um, you know, uh, fellow co-panelists, um, you know, the, the threats uh, that we see um, in the space domain are um, accelerating uh, as uh, more countries are developing um, dedicated um, anti-satellite uh, capabilities and we see this um, increasing growth in uh, technologies that are regarded as, as dual youth both by uh, states and, and um, uh, commercial um, entities. Uh, so, um, in, in uh, the face of these trends, uh, so the UN has been talking about outer space security in the context of strategic risks and, and preventing an arms race for, for several decades now, but in, in light of these trends, there's really a new urgency uh, to actually uh, seeing um, um, progress. Um, so traditionally, the disarmament um, you know, toolkit has a lot of different mechanisms. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, restrictions, limitations, export controls um, that um, traditionally focus on um, discrete uh, categories of weapon systems or, or, or technologies. Um, now, in, in the space domain, um, there is a lot of challenges that have to be you know, overcome. One is sort of the um, dual-use nature of um, these um, objects that 
nature of the space domain that makes it very difficult to understand uh, the functions of capabilities of, of a satellite in, in orbit or, or the use of terrestrial military systems that um, can, can be used in an NIT uh, satellite function. Uh, so uh, to sort of you know, to take stock of these trends and, and to um, you know, really look at how to uh, you know, accelerate development of, of solutions we've had for the past couple of years, uh, a process, an open-ended working group, open-ended in the UN speak means it's open to all member states to, to participate, that has been looking to develop um, norms, rules, and principles of, of responsible uh, state behavior. Um, and so this has been designed to give a bit more of a flexible approach to allow all states to come and um, provide their own uh, threat perceptions and, and, and to have a discussion around um, what collection of, of various measures can, can be adopted to um, address those um, threats. Um, so, um, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, where we see this sort of work going, and, and I'll, I'll speak more to this a, a little bit later on, you know, it's important to note that, um, you know, no um, state uh, opposes the possible development of, of new law going forward, but there's also this recognition that law takes uh, a long time uh, to uh, develop, and we heard some some of the panelists yesterday that um, there are also risk of being too overly prescriptive or too rigid in, in um, legal mechanisms. Um, but you know, the bright side is that if we look at the historical development of, of norms in, in the UN system that constrain weapons or even govern the peaceful uses of outer space, um, you know, these can be preceded by the development of. of norms of, of, of principles that we can all identify and that we can try to see how, how they work, how we can verify more stringent rules in, in, into the future. And, um, and so this is, this is where we see um, is unique with the, the approach of the open-ended working group. Um, so this working group started its work last year. It will have its final session in August of, of this year. Um, and uh, you know, we're hoping that it will produce uh, you know, a, a good and strong set of um, consensus recommendations that can be the basis for um, you know, future work and the elaboration of more ambitious measures in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm ready. You and I met at the Open Air Working Group, uh, and I was really impressed by the prominent role the EU and Nigeria have played in the discussions there. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about why has Nigeria been so involved in these discussions on space security and stability? And if you're comfortable, you know, why do emerging space countries, what do they get out of being involved in these conversations? Um, thank you, Victoria, um, and also thank you to the CKL World Foundation for making it uh, possible for me to be here today and to partake in this very, very timely summit on space. Um, I would say that a country like Nigeria that engages in discussions on space systems for us, we would base our involvement in these discussions on three key principles. Uh, first of which would be, obviously, the prevention of an arms race in outer space. And then the other two would be um, the issue of ensuring that the use of space is carried out on equal basis and also equitable basis. Now, we are cognizant of the fact that um, states have sovereign rights to develop space capabilities for different reasons, including weaponized reasons. But for Nigeria, who uh, engages in the use of space systems for strictly peaceful uses, you know, we believe that we deserve some sort of non-usage assurances of these weaponized capabilities, you know, in order for us to be able to engage in our space activities for peaceful uses and be free from interference from states who engage in space activities for other reasons. For example, Nigeria has four uh, space assets to support uh, critical services, public-oriented services, including telecoms, uh, cybersecurity, uh, and the likes. You get the picture. Strictly peaceful uses. We don't have any intentions to develop weaponized space capabilities. And so that is why in the OEWG, like Michael mentioned, uh, we, we take a prominent role in involving ourselves in this discussion in order to advocate for binding measures to be established to regulate space <coughs> activities, basically. Uh, and also um, the issue of ASAT testing. 
you know, imagine a country like Nigeria being impacted by uh, space debris. It would take a whole lot for us to begin to come together to, you know, probably launch another uh, space asset into orbit or what have you. It would be difficult for a country like Nigeria. That is why we are saying that we want to see uh, space being utilized on an equitable and equal basis, and states who do not intend to get into that, you know, other focus should be free to be able to enjoy the benefits of space. Um, also, speaking on the issue of the prevention of an arms race in outer space, I'm sure the issue of um, nuclear pro uh, proliferation is not new to any one of us here. Um, so Nigeria views this situation as we might begin to foresee a situation where uh, the nuclear arms race could extend to the space domain. I mean, we might see uh, a situation where states begin to develop capabilities to place nuclear weapons in outer space and also deploy them from there due to the vantage point you know, space has over Earth. You know, so we, we feel like um, all these uh, aspects are areas that we need to really come together to address. And I would now segue to the other part of your question. Um, for states like Nigeria who engage in these um, discussions, what do we want to benefit? Now, we want to leverage on the inclusivity perspective of the OEWG process to lend our voices, critical voices, to you know, setting the tone for which the measures that we hopefully uh, are looking forward to, to emanate from the OEWG process to cater to our needs as well. And we are talking about measures that will you know, uh, most likely incorporate non-usage assurances and the likes, you can call them uh, confidence building measures or, you know, in the nuclear terms, negative security assurances, you know, something along those lines. Um, I will now round up by saying that also we, 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 uh, we also would leverage on the OEWG process, you know, to share our views and concerns on what we term or what we would consider as irresponsible behaviors in outer space, you know, which is very critical to our uh, space-related activities. Um, well, the, to conclude, I would just say that um, space in itself has become an incontrovertible subject that we all, public-private uh, uh, partnerships, true public-private partnerships, must take strident steps to address holistically in order to avert issues of conflicts in outer space and then ultimately prevent another arms race in outer space. Thank you. Thank you, Nredi. Uh, so, Marie, it's kind of a similar question for you. I know a lot of people may not associate Canada with security issues for space. Um, every Canadian I know will tell me, hey, do you know that we built the arm for the space station? But they don't talk about the security side. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know what are concerns does Canada have about space security and stability? Um, why is Canada so, again, a leader in the OEWG process and discussions? And what does your country hope to get out of the, the, the conversation there? Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. So, yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, this topic is usually led by uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Department. So National Defense is supporting the Foreign Affairs Department, and we are very committed to the responsible behaviors use of space. Uh, it's in our uh, defense policy since uh, 2017, so we are committed to that as well. So from our perspective, um, the answer to the question is that we cannot dissociate the stability and the security on Earth from the stability and the security in space. So those two are directly linked. Mm -hmm. And history has shown that Canada, as other nations, rely heavily on the stability to, for our prosperity, for the economy, uh, for the way of, of life, really. So similarly, we rely, we rely on space assets for that same things. Um, and 
uh, we believe that it's important that we maintain the space stability and also uh, the stability on Earth by this, at the same time. But unfortunately, as we've discussed today, space is not immune from, from conflict, and um, the geopolitical situation on Earth um, creates a situation where conflict could potentially expand to or begin in space. And what we are concerned about the most is that the harmful is about the potentially harmful impacts that military activities could have on the sustainability of space activities, as it was discussed today a lot, but also on critical infrastructures on Earth and uh, ultimately on civilian population. So just as an example, we've seen um, a lot of prolifer proliferation of uh, GPS jamming system. Uh, they are currently being used widely uh, by the Russian, for example, in Ukraine. And, what we are, and from a military perspective, we are going to be able to adapt to that, and we are learning on how to operate in a denied, a denied environment for GPS. But those systems also have uh, impact on civilian aviation, on uh, the civilian use of the GPS system in the, in the region, and also could have impact on, uh, on orbit assets as well that are not involved at all uh, in, the, in the conflict. So, um, the effort at the UN, as part of the OEWG, uh, as it was discussed, we are looking at uh, developing those responsible behaviors. Um, and it's, we also can make a, a good translation with the situation on Earth here. So on Earth, in our societies, we have those uh, well-recognized standards of, of, how, of what is responsible, what could be perceived as rude, what could be perceived as uh, provocative. But on space, we don't have those, those norms and when people on Earth follow those norms, it helps us all to live together and uh, be in a more, uh, we have a sense of certainty that is provided by that and of security that allows us to progress all together. So in outer space, as we lack that um, well-defined set of norm to get activities, um, we believe that it can lead to more instability and um, that could lead to reaction to certain action that would be escalatory or destabilizing. Um, so we need to clarify what those norms are to ensure that the actors in space, all, all the actors uh, can operate together. So this is why Canada is, is very involved in that, in that consultative process. And we are, very, we are happy as well that it's a very inclusive process, so every nation can, can join. And as well, uh, we've seen contribution from, uh, from other uh, organizations, so, such as the, as the Secure World Foundation. So I just want to answer directly the question of the, this panel. So why... Um, why it's also the problem for uh, commercial and civil actors, and why commercial actors and civil actors should care about the ongoing discussion at the OEWG on responsible behavior in general, and also how they can contribute to advancing the development of those norms. So why should you care? So unfortunately, as it was discussed, non-military assets are also put at threat by the instability in space, um, and they are not immune from uh, what could uh, could happen to them um, due to conflicts or in time, of, uh, in time of peace or in time of conflict. But we all benefit from, so we all benefit from more stability and security in space. And also, without the informed uh, contribution of the civil and commercial sectors, it's really, um, it's risky that the norms that will be defined uh, will not be defined in a way that can um, be adapted to all type of space activities. So we don't want the norm to be developed only for governmental or military activities, but we need the contribution of the other sectors as well. Um, so how can you, can you contribute um, to the discussion? And also, uh, I wanted to know that because most of the on-orbit assets now are not military or governmental uh, assets, the contribution of commercial and civil actors are so important um, because if we want the, the behaviors that are agreed to become actual norms and potentially legally binding, they need to be followed by, by all the actors in space. So, um, and, um, so yeah, I encourage the, the commercial and civil actors to continue get, getting informed on the threat um, and also to continue to express their views. And we've seen a lot of contribution already by, for example, uh, commercial consortium or other organizations such as, as your organization that um, uh, published letters or their opinion, and um, I have to say that those uh, positions are read and uh, considered as national uh, country as country develop their national position on, on the issue. Um, I've read all of them. So, <laughs> um, and as we we are building the Canadian position, we take them into into account for sure. So. Um, 
Yeah, and one additional point I wanted to make as well is that I think uh, the, one of the great contributions uh, of the OEWG is that uh, it helps de define what are the threats and what are the perception of those threats. And this is something that I believe commercial and civil uh, community can be benefit from as well. Uh, it's the same for the, all the report that the Secure World Foundation has put forward. Uh, because when you understand more the threat, then you can, um, when you want to collaborate with national defense in the, and with the armed force, for a uh, space, space project, um, y when you understand the concern, then you can, you can develop your system in a way that will be reassuring for the, for the military actors. And we are looking into uh, in integrating more and more services in our operation. So knowing that uh, your business or your, your cap capability is adapted and resilient uh, mm -hmm. is really, really reassuring and enables uh, further cooperation between uh, all the actors as well. Thank you, Maurice. Yeah, everyone's voice matters. That's a good point to underline. Um, Anirud, you know, again, you were a head of an SSA company, and you probably have a lot of thoughts on how SSA can help verify actions on orbit and underline the overall security and sustainability space. What, do you, what, what suggestions would you have for that? I mean, first, uh, let's just understand how SSA is done or why SSA is required for us to even verify uh, what's happening in the orbit or understand uh, the knowledge of what's happening in the orbit or the objects. So there are three um, major steps, or I would say uh, three three basic steps in space situation awareness. The first, uh, I mean, the first part is uh, the infrastructure or uh, capability for us to be able to even understand what's happening in the orbit on uh, the infrastructure perspective. Uh, that's basically sensors or, I mean, be it ground-based, space-based, even to understand how this works and can it track objects uh, to a good extent, how accurate it is. And the next step is, um, you know, once we have data from these sensors, uh, to be able to fuse this data, process this data into, um, you know, uh, positions or uh, state vectors, once that is done, the last part of it is analytics, and that's where um, it is being used by the industry as space situation awareness services. So during this process, we have uh, different actors working on different part of the value chain. Uh, we have governments who have set up infrastructure a few decades ago, or, or uh, I mean, even during the Cold War, we had infrastructure to track objects in space. Uh, so the first, the first step is, uh, you know, making sure that we have enough uh, sensors for us to be able to track what's happening in the orbit. Uh, so for every industry to grow, it needs a basic infrastructure that it can grow on. Uh, the infrastructure here is not just the hardware, but the entire um, underlying infrastructure that the economy should have or the industry should have. Uh, for it to grow and uh, flourish. So in space, like unlike other domains like aviation and marine domain awareness, we have uh, different ways for us to govern what's happening in space, and it's much easier. Uh, what's happening in that particular space, it's much easier for us in air and marine cases because you have uh, jurisdictions that you can draw. You can uh, draw boundaries and determine who's, I mean, whose domain is this, and how do you uh, collaborate on a global scale. But when it comes to space, there is no physical boundaries that you can draw or put limitations for the governance. So that brings us to a question where uh, we need to establish uh, good relations between uh, agencies or countries, spacefaring nations working, uh, not only on um, you know, the infrastructure side, but also on uh, data sharing side. So we need to have uh, data sharing agreements between nations for us to be able to ex exchange data because not all the time, uh, let's just say, not all the time, U.S. cannot have sensors in uh, China or Russia or, uh, or have access to sensors there. So it becomes difficult for us to even get good amount of data sets of what's happening in the orbit. Uh, so one of the things uh, that SSA does here uh, is to be able to support uh, the operations in the orbit. And right now, it's more important than ever. That's just because of... Uh, what's happening in space, the congestion, the mega constellation that is adding up. Uh, so this requires uh, this particular infrastructure and moving uh, further, this will be one of the basic requirement that every uh, space actor should have uh, while they operate or you know have assets in the orbit. So this becomes um, you know, one of the intrinsic part of the ecosystem itself, like it is for the aviation sector today. There is no aviation sector without the backbone of air traffic management or the infrastructure that supports the entire aviation, not just the military side, but also the commercial side. So the similar thing is prone to happen in space, and space situation awareness will be the basis for uh, everybody to build upon, uh, because that's how we'll know what's happening in the orbit. And now talking about the second and third steps, which is 
data fusion, data processing, and the last part is analytics. Here, um, you know, no matter um, how good your algorithms are or how good your data processing systems are, unless you have accurate, good enough sensor information, it doesn't make. I mean, it doesn't really make sense even if you have good algorithms to process these data. So uh, for us to have imperative and common understanding of what's happening in space, you need to have uh, sensors, which right now we have a lot of commercial companies uh, like us, or uh, I mean, few other companies working in this sector where they're not just contributing to generation of data, but they're also complementing what the governments have already done or spacefaring nations have already done. Like the US was the front, uh, forefront nation in terms of having infrastructure. US and Russia had infrastructure to track objects in the orbit before. Now we have commercial companies supporting their efforts uh, in, in adding more data points to uh, what's already available. So today we have a catalog of around 35,000 objects that we, um, I mean, that we can use every single day. But we need to go uh, to a point where we have more than at least 100,000 objects at the pace we are going because there are debris particles below 20 centimeter in size, which is very difficult to track with the existing systems. You need complementary systems to even understand what's happening. So that fulls, or, or that fulfills the requirement of having a better uh, catalog so that we don't have false positives when uh, you provide this data to any user, be it military or commercial uh, sectors. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say I love how passionate the panel is on this topic, uh, but we're running low on time, so I'm going to ask you guys to, uh, you know, just think about you know how we can quickly get through all the questions we wanted to. Um, so with that, Mike, we've been um, you know there've been concerns on this panel that have been raised in terms of ASAT test debris, irresponsible actions, verifying activities in orbit. You know, how are those concerns being addressed either in the open-ended working group or elsewhere in the UN system? Great. So. Um, I think the first thing I, I should um, say is that um, you know the UN has um, slowly been working to develop you know, um, norms and, and measures. And, and, and 2013, for instance, there, there was an expert group that proposed a set of transparency and, and confidence building measures uh, that proposed um, various um, measures like uh, information exchanges on um, space security policies and military expenditures, um, exchanges on um, space activities um, that provided a set of um, risk reduction notifications and, and, and a number of other measures, including um, visits to launch sites and facilities, consultative mechanisms, and, and, and so forth. Um, and and uh, earlier this April, we did see you know, agreement in a, in a universal UN body uh, to actually uh, agree on a, a set of um, uh, um, recommendations on the implementation of those measures. And so we, we do see um, you know, scope for progress, even in a very difficult, challenging international security environment. Um, coming uh, over and back to the um, discussions in the open-ended working group, um, so uh, in, in the first instance, I should say a little bit more about how it's kind of set up its work, and, and um, it's already had an opportunity to look at how uh, the implementation of existing um, international law um, can, can help uh, mitigate space threats, and, and so this has had um, involved uh, discussions on specific aspects of the Outer Space Treaty, for instance, the um, principle of, of due regard. Um, it's also had a conversation on, on the law of armed conflict and, and how uh, the unique uh, characteristics of, of the um, space environment might, might constrain uh, certain types of um, hostile actions uh, in, in a way that's different from, from, from other, other domains. And, and so the, already this forms a good basis for kind of understanding what are those limits on uh, state uh, behavior in, in outer space. Uh, another feature of the conversation is, is that it hasn't been exclusively looking at objects in, in, in orbit. Um, so the, the discussion has um, uh, looked at um, uh, all, all sorts of uh, you know, um, vectors of, of, of threats is how this has been described in, in, in the work. So, so looking at um, um, threats that go from you know, terrestrial to, to space, um, but also in the other direction, um, space-based uh, threats that can target um, objects on the ground, um, threats that might originate from other systems in, in orbit, um, and also um, you know, threats to um, the, the ground uh, segment of, of, of space systems, whether those are from um, you know, conventional you know, means of attack or even, even and cyber means, and that, that's been one, one of the key uh, you know, threats that um, especially um, commercial actors have, have expressed coming into um, um, this process. Um, in terms of the set of measures uh, that the, the group uh, will, will be uh, negotiating, of, of course, I can't sort of prejudge you know, where we'll land uh, on that. Those <laughs> negotiations still have to take place later this summer. But in, in terms of the broad areas um, that, uh, you know, where um, uh, states have 
um, you know, expressed interest in, in exploring. Uh, those have included um, measures that would, of course, avoid the deliberate damage instruction of, of space objects or uh, the use of space objects as a means of attack. Um, measures to avoid um, development or deployment of um, any kind of um, counter space um, capabilities. Um, measures that uh, to avoid uh, interference with the normal and safe operation of, of spacecraft through any, any means. Um, uh, measures to regulate acts in, involving uh, military systems, given taking into account that um, you know, some uh, critical military infrastructure um, could, could um, you know, really pose risk if those systems were, were, were threatened in, in, in any sorts of way. Um, it's an important um, kind of emergent um, conversation around the need to um, extend uh, protections in international law to um, you know, certain objects that are entitled to special protection, um, critical civilian infrastructure, um, and, and in particular, um, human space flight as well are, are, are both kind of categories of um, objects or activities that, that you know, already enjoy special uh, protection and, and that this process could help to codify um, the, those principles. Um, you know, any provision of assistance or encouragement to other actors that might engage in any of these um, restricted activities. Um, there was discussion on how to cooperate um, more in space situational awareness, uh, a discussion around um, you know, different aspects of policies and, and doctrines, uh, strategies that might also contribute to, to raising um, attentions, um, the expanded use of, of pre- and post-launch uh, notifications, notifications of, of military operations, and, and of course, how, how to make better use of the consultative mechanisms. So this is just to give you a sense of, of the range of, of measures that have um, been put on the table um, that, that states will be uh, working to negotiate uh, later this uh, summer. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, just to kind of come back very briefly to the points that the um, Undersecretary General Ryder made in his keynote address. Um, you know, the Secretary General has proposed that matter space is one of the tracks for the summer of the future in, in 2024. And, and so we are, we are very much hoping um, that um, states will be making use of the relevant disarmament bodies um, and with the widest possible acceptance to develop uh, norms, rules, and, and, and principles, and on that basis to launch negotiations on what we hope will be a legally binding instrument to ensure peace, um, security, and the prevention of an arms race in, in outer space. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good luck uh, as you guys finish things up this summer. I know it's not an easy job, but we appreciate you guys doing it. Uh, Maurice, um, Canada was the second country to make the commitment not to conduct um, destructive anti satellite missile tests. Congratulations on the leadership you guys showed there. Uh, there are now 13 countries that have made that commitment. Um, but could you talk a little bit about what were the drivers for Canada to make that commitment? And um, do you possibly see maybe an expansion of that commitment at some point even to a legally binding option? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so Canada has been adv advocating for a ban on uh, DAA SAT tests for decades. So it's a, it's a position that we've had for a long time, and uh, we've made hundreds of statements on it at the UN. Uh, we've submitted dozens of papers. So really, this is a position that, a national position that was clear to us. So, um, and um, supporting the, the ban, the US ban, was really in line with that long lasting commitment. And we, really, we were really happy to be there the second uh, nation to, to put our position uh, publicly on this. So for us, um, destructive DAA SAT missile test uh, is, the, is the most obvious threat and visible threat uh, to the space domain that stem from military activities. So many nations have tested it in the past, and as it was discussed this morning by General Shaw, uh, this is no longer something that can be, uh, that can be accepted given the, the third space age or the proliferation of space activities. And we've seen that uh, the debris created by the, the recent Russian one, which was quite surprising to us that they, they would do it as well, and also, uh, quite frankly, uh, disappointing. Um, it, it created threat for all the, uh, the, uh, um, the assets that are in LEO and also for the International Space Station. It had to maneuver, so it creates uh, increased costs for every space actors. And I don't think I need to, to expand too much to this forum on uh, why additional space debris are bad, really. Um, but why have, we specific, why have states uh, specifically united behind um, banning direct ascent uh, tests, uh, kinetic direct ascent tests first before any other debris creating tests. So the, the answer to that is that it's because it's, it, it is simple to recognize, it's easy to attribute, and given it's, it is very detriment, detrimental uh, on the space environment, this was one of the, the top threats that needed to be addressed as a priority. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a first step, really. Um, 
And while Canada had never had the intent to do such tests, um, it was clear that we would support it uh, publicly because we need more nations to add their, their voice to that uh, commitment for it to become a norm and ultimately um, uh, an, an, an internationally agreed upon behaviors, uh, um, principles. Sorry. So um, this is also something I wanted this uh, firm to, uh, to know that it's, I think it's important that if you believe this is an uh, important ban, that you uh, maybe approach your government and that you reinforce the importance of that ban uh, because we, need, we really need more uh, nations to support it publicly. And this is, uh, in terms of making it uh, a legally binding instrument, for the ASAT test, we understand this threat very well, uh, we understand capability, and uh, I think there's a, a big alignment between nations about why it's bad and why we need to, to prevent it. So yes, Canada would support a legally binding instrument. And for the other threat and the other uh, type of, uh, of debris-creating uh, event, uh, we believe that we need to continue growing the understanding be before we can come to an agreement on, on such legally binding uh, instrument. But for the ASAT test, the, an the answer is simple. So it, it, it's a yes. Great. Glad to hear it. All right, uh, other countries, you've been given notice. Um, Tim, how can debris management, whether it's, if re, it's removal on or servicing a derelict spacecraft, how can that help in space security and stability? Um, well, first, thanks for the softball question. You're welcome. That, that's an easy one. Um, and I think I would extend the question to the entire scope of in-orbit services, uh, whether it's mission extension or um, servicing and repair or manufacturing in space and debris removal and disposal, there's a whole range of services that all contribute to that circular space economy that Caroline talked about yesterday. Um, so I think they all contribute directly to, uh, to the question. Um, I think we also spend an awful lot of time talking about SSA and STM as if it is the panacea, like that's the solution to the problem. Um, and, and I think we need to recognize that, uh, that if you never reach stability, if you never reach equilibrium between the sources of debris, whether it's in terms of mass or number or some other metric, between those sources and the sinks, the rate at which you produce it and the rate at which you take it out of orbit, eventually the best SSA and STM system is gonna get overwhelmed, right? So, so it does help you prevent collisions but it is really a stopgap. It's a, it's a way of uh, allowing you to operate in a congested environment that is getting more and more congested, therefore you need to be better at it. It does not directly address the fundamental problem of an unstable environment. We need to think about preventing the generation of new debris and taking debris out of orbit. Um, and creating a, a, an equilibrium there. Unfortunately, we're, we're not really all that good at prevention, right? <laughs> um, we, we tend, I think, as a species um, to exploit our environments until the cost of exploitation outweighs the cost of stewardship, all right? And, and that's true terrestrially. It's true with air pollution, water, fishing. It extends to space, too. Um, and I think we're, we're there. I mean, we're seeing the effects of that now. And unfortunately, that means that remediation is gonna have to be part of that solution, right? It, it's far less expensive to not, pro not produce the debris in the first place, but we're probably gonna. So remediation's gotta be part of the solution. Thank you. Yeah, I think oftentimes people tend to look at space flight safety and space security stability as two separate things, whereas one definitely feeds into the other and shapes the other Absolutely. as well. Uh, and Rennie, you know, just in broad terms, easy question, what responsible behaviors would you like to see all space actors carry out? Thank in you. In the short amount of time we have left. Yep, and, uh... yep, I see it, I see it. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Um, well, for Nigeria, I'll take us quickly back to the open-ended working group now. Like, you know, one of the challenges the OEWG has had is for states to come together and agree on what could constitute responsible behaviors in outer space. Um, yesterday, during the panel, I heard someone mention something about how difficult it was to get over 100 states to agree on something. You know, yeah, it's also in the OEWG. However, 
for Nigeria, we have you know, a framework of what we consider as responsible behaviors in outer space. So in order not to you know, leave anything out, I'll just uh, give you an insight into what we consider as responsible behaviors in outer space. Um, first of all, it's a commitment by states not to conduct destructive direct ASAT, ASAT testing in order to mitigate the growing threat of space debris capable of causing harm to existing space systems of other sovereign states. Also, for states not to test and use kinetic outer space capabilities. For example, we have uh, states developing capabilities, uh, uh, um, states developing capabilities to eject you know, projectiles, you know, where space assets get impacted by these uh, things, and then deliberately colliding with other uh, space assets of sovereign states. You know, all these pose serious concerns to a state like Nigeria. And also for states to understand that conducting rendezvous operations require consent from states who could be potentially impacted by these activities. And also, another uh, uh, responsible behavior we would like to see in outer space is for states to understand that the consideration regarding the conduct of proximity operations is, is key because there should be information sharing, there should be transparency in conducting certain activities in outer space. And finally, you know, for states to refrain from conducting activities that could interfere with space-based critical services of other sovereign states. For example, uh, cyber interference that may cause harm to civilians or disrupt public services. I have uh, earlier mentioned that Nigeria conducts a space-related activity strictly for peaceful uses, uh, and most of these uses serve public interest. So once we have uh, states acting irresponsibly, you know, and altering, you know, these functions that we use our space systems for, it becomes a problem. And we will term that as irresponsible behaviors in outer space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've been getting a lot of questions coming in from the audience, and we're running low on time. Um, but, um, you know, one thing that comes up a lot is the idea of transparency and sharing information. Um, how do you balance the needs of improving confidence in terms of activities in orbit, that countries are going to do and actors are going to do what they said they're going to do, but also balance, you know, there, there's some mistrust in the geopolitical environment right now. How do, we, how do we thread that needle between sharing enough information but also maybe having difficulty in understanding what other countries are going to be doing if they're, or trust they're going to say they're going to do what they do? And perhaps some of the UN folks want to start off with that one. Sure, no, happy to take that. And one. very quickly. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, the, I think the two sentence response is really just, you know, sustain, you know, engagement in, in an institutional setting. Uh, that's been one of the benefits of the OAWG process is that it did provide that uh, platform for um, states to um, uh, change uh, their own threat perceptions and, and to discuss that. And then that was an important trust building exercise that the group was able to, to undertake. Um, and even just having a regular platform for um, exchanging. Uh, national space security policies and, and discussing uh, being able to clarify questions is also an important trust building exercise that um, could, could really help um, at, at this particular moment. Thanks. Thank you. Other thoughts? Marie, so you... Yeah, um, maybe just one thing. I, um, I think in the past it was mostly reserved to the nation to be able to see what was happening in space, but now with all the commercial capabilities that we have uh, available to us, it's it's harder and harder to hide what is being done in space. So I think it greatly contributes to increasing that confidence between the, the actors because you have some uh, unclass and uh, uh, proof of what is happening. So you cannot deny anymore as much as state could have in the past. Back in the day, things Back have changed. Back in the day. And ready? Uh, I would just attribute this to just a few words, or two words, uh, legally binding. Now, uh, how truly can we confirm the level of transparency that states actually exhibit? Uh, but true advocation for legally binding measures to regulate space-based activities, you know, we can hold states accountable for irresponsible behaviors. And cognizant of this very, very important aspect, I believe, you know, states will begin to take 
uh, information sharing, which could be incorporated into this binding measures. They'll begin to take them you know, more seriously, knowing fully well that they can be held accountable for irresponsible behaviors in other space. Thank you. Uh, and then just very quickly, for the commercial operators, there's a question that came in about how do you protect against cybersecurity attack? That's a real threat. And very quick, quickly, in 10 seconds or less, so how do you guys protect against cyber attacks? Cyber attacks, I mean, we've seen a few weeks ago, uh, I mean, a French company demonstrating that. So um, at this point in time, uh, you know, apart from building, uh, you know, countermeasures to it, there is nothing much uh, uh, that, that commercial companies are doing at this point in time. Rather, I would say that we'll have more, um, you know, more to work on the encryptions on the onboard uh, satellite computers. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I mean, there are sort of escalating standards and, <laughs> and care that you can implement, and that's, that's kind of the strategy at this point. And it's a priority for your organization? Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Great. Uh, well, we're getting really close on time, but just to wrap up um, for the panelists, if you could just say, you know, if you want the audience to walk away from saying, okay, I heard this person speak, and this is what I'm taking away from their conversation, what would you like that takeaway to be? Uh, maybe we'll start and go down the line. I'm ready? All right. um, I would say for the audience to bear in mind and take away the fact that uh, space in itself has become an existential necessity. And the way or uh, manner in which we operate it, utilize it, sustain it, secure it, would largely depend on the role that each and every one of us here plays, from states to uh, the private sector, you know. And yeah, I'd like everyone to take that away from this. Thank you. Thank you. Maurice? Yes, so uh, having worked for National Defense on Space Security and uh, Strategy for a few years now, um, I've seen a, a shift in the way we perceive the contribution of commercial and civil actors. So previously it was more, uh, we develop our national position and then uh, uh, commercial actors are providing us with their services. But now the integration of the perspective is paramount if we want to move forward uh, on those topics. And I think uh, I've seen a shift in, inside the organization about that mindset of making sure that all actors are more and more integrated in the in this discussion. And this is most like the commercial integration cell, um, center as part of the operation themselves, but also as we develop national policies and, uh, and strategy. So I encourage uh, the, the other actors as well to, to come forward and engage as, uh, more and more with, with national defense and uh, with the, their government. More and more engagement, great, yeah. thank you. Tim? Yeah, I would say that the, the takeaway is that the, the LEO and GEO environments are really fragile. Um, and, and it's probably not an exaggeration to say that, that the LEO environment is going to be our next environmental crisis if we're not careful. Um, there is often a, a call for more study, more data, better characterization, and so on at fora like this. We've heard some of that today and yesterday in particular. Um, and I, and I think there's a danger in that. I mean, the, the answer is obvious. What we need to do is obvious. We, more study, more analysis is terrific, and we can write lots of papers on it. It's not gonna change the answer. In 1995, NASA published their first guidance, and it said, don't create intentional debris, don't explode, don't collide, and get your stuff out of orbit when you're done tools and the capabilities we have at our disposal have changed since 1995, but the, that basic premise has not. And so I would really ask that, that we not stifle the progress on action um, with you know, endless calls for additional study. Thank you. Anirudh? I mean, we've spoken uh, enough about the importance of space sustainability and space um, from um, common uh, people's <coughs> Uh, point in, uh, I mean, their point of view and also from the government agencies or military point of view. And I think it's time for us to act on both uh, prevention and remediation of what's already happening. And, and we are at the right time to solve that, otherwise it'll become the next crisis. Uh, so one of the things that I would like to mention is it's not just, uh, I mean, we should not just complain that uh, there needs to be a regulation or on, the uh, or on the government side there needs to be better policy. Rather, it's uh, I mean, the burden is on the um, 
ecosystem, basically both commercial, uh, public, private, and uh, military organizations to work together and solve for it right now. Thank you. And then I know we've gone over, so Mike, if you could just be real succinct. What do you want your ta the takeaway to be from your remarks today? Yeah, sure. Two points. One, uh, you know, I agree that the, the UN hasn't um, r really um, always succeeded in prevention, but prevention is far more easier before capabilities and, and threats have, have matured. And so that's why there's urgency now to see these measures um, uh, develop. Uh, the, the second point is that there, there's a real you know, opportunity and a need to have you know, all voices you know, represented, the current OEWG uh, and invited attendance from commercial actors, civil society recommend, uh, representatives and, and, and academia and, and so we will be looking uh, as far, much as we can within our mandates to uh, you know, incorporate uh, voices uh, from you know, as many stakeholders as possible um, going forward. And, and so please encourage all those, uh, given that um, threats to space really does affect uh, everybody to you know, use those opportunities to speak up, share your own threat perceptions, participate, and to give inputs into, into these um, intergovernmental processes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking this panel for this very in-depth conversation.